This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And Paul feels that the Corinthians have been led away by other preachers or apostles. He believes they're thinking that he isn't the real deal anymore. So a lot of this chapter deals with Paul reminding them of who he is. Paul also reminds them that he is out to see souls saved. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 9.22, he says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So let's go through this chapter with that idea in mind. And look at the subject of how to save some in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse by verse. So verse 1 it says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So number one, show someone you have been with Jesus Christ. Paul said, Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? If you're going to save some, then let them see that the Lord Jesus Christ has made a difference in you. Paul said, Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? In the book of Acts, chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So lost men aren't really impressed with how much you know about the Bible. They're impressed with you being a peculiar person, someone who has been with Jesus. And if you have been with Jesus, there's going to be something different about you. And it's going to make people think differently about you than they would someone else. First off, Paul says, am I not an apostle? So he certainly was an apostle. But the Corinthians seem to have forgotten. So he's reminding them, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And in Galatians 1.1 he says, Paul, an apostle. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So he is a God-called apostle. Next, he says, am I not free? Paul is free to do what he wants, even though he is a servant and a prisoner of Jesus Christ. If someone is a servant of Christ, then they are going to have to have spent some time with the Lord, laboring in the word and doctrine. You want to know how to make people realize that you got God with you? Spend time in the Word and Doctrine, and they're going to see Jesus on you. They'll be able to tell that you've been with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can tell when someone has been with ESPN and Netflix and Hulu and Comcast and DirecTV because they just talk about the latest TV shows and movies. But if someone has been with Jesus... Then they talk about Jesus and the Bible. There was a man named Apollos who was mighty in the scriptures. And it said this phrase about him. He was fervent in the spirit. People can tell you have been with Jesus because you talk about him and they see you reading the Bible. Living so much like Jesus Christ that they call you a Christian. They'll see that you are fervent in the spirit. In Romans 1 and verse 1, also written by Paul, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. So Paul was a servant, yet he was free, because he has the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Notice he says, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? He sure did. On the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. So he literally saw Jesus Christ. Next he says, are, you, are not ye my work in the Lord? The Corinthians were doubting Paul, even though Paul had already put in work on them. He had led them to the Lord himself, and yet they're doubting him. 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, For though you, were ten, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul was their spiritual father even. 
And many times a person will get saved sitting under a preacher and he gives them the gospel. And for a long time, they'll, they'll listen to that preacher and they really think a lot of him. And then it's like they get too good for him. They'll no longer listen to him. They'll move on to somebody else. Maybe even start talking bad about that preacher. But you always want to remember the man that led you to the Lord. And not be carried about with all these other people that come, may come up. Because many times the people that come in after you get saved are from the devil. Because... You see, before you get saved, the devil doesn't doesn't have to attack you as much because he's already got you. And then after you get saved, that's when the wolves come out. And that's when the false teachers come out trying to get you off track. But in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, it says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So if people are going to believe you have been with Jesus, then you're going to have to put in some work. Paul asked the Corinthians, Are not ye my work in the Lord? And he had the signs of an apostle. As it said there in 2 Corinthians 12:12, 12, 12, he had the signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And he, they saw their self that Paul was the real deal. He was a real apostle sent from God. Uh, so Paul asked the Corinthians, Are not ye my work in the Lord? Most Christians don't do anything but go to church and look down on people that ain't there or maybe missed a service. But what are they doing when they're not there through the week? A whole bunch of nothing. Uh, there is more to the Christian life than just going to church and sitting there to listen to the preacher. 1 Corinthians 9.2 If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. The Corinthians themselves are proof that Paul is an apostle. They are the seal of his apostleship. Now, moving on, number two. If you're going to save some, then handle your haters graciously. In verse 3 it says, My answer to them that do examine me is this. So Paul had some people examining him. He had haters trying to find some uncleanness in him 24 hours a day. You see today when a preacher or a teacher gets a good following from people, you'll have some men who sit back and examine the man and they begin to find fault. Mark 7, 2 talks about fault-finding Pharisees. And that's just exactly what they are, is just a bunch of Pharisees. But just be nice to all your critics. If you've got a bunch of haters, just be nice to them. If a lost man sees how you handle your enemies, then this can cause him to see something different about you. This can cause him to see the Lord in you and could eventually cause him to want to be a Christian himself. In 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened, threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So Paul had some men who would examine him trying to find fault. And Paul says in verse 4, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Paul's at liberty to eat and drink what he wants. Then he says in verse 5, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Paul is at liberty to take a wife if he pleases. When it says sister here, it's referring to a born-again woman who would be your sister in the Lord. So if your wife is saved, then she is not only your wife, but she is your sister in the Lord. And Paul says he has the power to do this as well as other apostles. For example, we know that Cephas, which is Peter, was married. 
In verse 6 it says, Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. Paul and Barnabas could have completely relied on living off their ministry. Paul was a tent maker according to Acts 18. And he could have never made another tent and let the sheep keep him up. However, he worked anyway. Paul could eat and drink what he wanted. He, could, he had liberty, but he didn't because he didn't take people's money because he didn't want his liberty to be a stumbling block. He also didn't want anyone saying he was doing something he shouldn't. So he wasn't one of those people that went around begging for money. And one way to handle your fault finders is to not do anything in front of them that might appear evil, even if it isn't evil. Paul had fault finders, and he knew that if he went around telling people he needed their money, then they're going to make something out of that. They're going to find fault. So Paul just didn't do it. But the main thing Paul was being accused of by some examiners is that he was in it for the money. He was being accused of that. He could have taken money for the ministry, but he paid his own way. Now verse 7. Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? He says, Who goeth to warfare any time at his own charges? Meaning, a soldier doesn't have to have a full-time job when he is over there fighting a war. Someone else is going to keep him up. A vine dresser plants a vineyard and eats up his own fruit. A shepherd eats the milk of the flock. The ministry is like warfare. You're a soldier in the Lord's army. It is like being a vine dresser. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And Paul is also a shepherd. He feeds the sheep. So Paul has every right to demand material things to be given in return for feeding the Corinthians because his job as a minister is like these other occupations that people receive money for and people think that well their pastor has it made and he only has to work on Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night but there's so much more to it than that all those hours to prepare a sermon all those hours going to visit people it's a full-time job and here a verse is showing how the ministry is like being a soldier and a shepherd and a husbandman or a farmer. So 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So if you're a Christian and you're in the ministry, it's like you're a soldier. In 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4, it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So there it's like being a shepherd. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 9, it says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So there it's compared to being like a farmer or a husband. So some tips to save some is to be a worker. And that doesn't mean if you're a pastor, you must have a secular job. Being a pastor is also hard work if you do it, if you do it correctly. And people can see that. Also, you need to prove to people that you don't need their money. I don't need anyone's money to put these studies out. I don't need anyone's money to study. I don't need anyone's money to post these studies on here. But you see all these guys going around constantly begging for people's money constantly taking up offerings constantly talking about how they need money for the ministry which is fine if they accept money and paul says if you preach the gospel you live of the gospel 
but constantly talking about how they need money for the ministry. Over and over and over. It makes you start thinking, how much money does a man really need anyway? Paul just wasn't one of those who was constantly after someone's money. He thought it was good and right to give to your preacher, but he didn't act like he just had to have it, you see. And you don't want to get yourself in such a mess where you just have to have everyone's money to stay doing what you're doing. Now verse 7, Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? So Paul is it saying on his own that a minister should be supported. The law also says it. It says in verse 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? So the ox is allowed to eat the corn on as he works. He's allowed, allowed to eat. He can put his head down and eat it. So you shouldn't stop a man who labors in the word and doctrine from getting carnal things for his labor. And you have another extreme where people are against someone in the ministry getting money and they'll teach against that but as it says in Deuteronomy 25 4 thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn the Lord didn't want them putting something on him to keep him from eating so he says thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn so you shouldn't just go around begging for money all the time when you're in brand new suits and brand new cars and brand new bus, brand new everything. What do you think that does for the lost man's mind when he sees you up there dressed like a rich man and you're still talking about getting an offering and you have PayPal donation buttons all over your website right there front and center before you see sermons, before you see statement of faith before you see contact before you see the about page you see a big paypal donation button right there on the website front and center how much money does a man really need anyway you don't want to take it so far then on the other hand you don't want to take it so far to where you say a preacher shouldn't get paid or shouldn't be taken care of and you shouldn't say a pastor should have to work a full-time secular job pretending that being a pastor isn't also hard work it's just the less of an emphasis you can put on money the better that way the lost world doesn't think you're like the rest of the 90 percent of christians and preachers out there who are famous money hungry belly worshipers i mean what do you see the preachers on tv talking about money 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 that's all they talk about Send me your money and all this stuff. And that's who the lost world sees, and that is their idea of preachers. So when they come to your church, they're gonna you're gonna get up there and talk about money. So they're gonna be like, just as I thought. So that's a tip that save some is lay off all the talk about money. In verse 10 it says, Or saith he it all together for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope. And that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Want a tip on how you can save some? Just keep plowing and threshing even when you're not reaping. If you're doing service for the Lord, a lot of it will be just plowing and threshing without reaping. When I teach, my burden is trying to get people interested in the Bible. And it's a lot of plowing and threshing and Every now and then you get someone who gets their interest sparked enough to read the Word of God for themselves outside of the church building. Uh, most Christians don't even open their Bible unless they're in a church building. And even then they may not do much reading. But verse 11 says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Meaning if Paul has begotten them through the gospel... If he has fed them spiritually with the word of God, then he should be able to reap their carnal things. Money, food, supplies, 
whatever he would need just to stay alive. These are the carnal things. Food, water, clothes. Whatever you do to take care of the flesh is carnal things. Now verse 12, If others be partaker of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So others have been partaker of this power, meaning they have been, the Corinthians have been helping other men in the ministry with carnal things. Paul is basically saying, why wouldn't they do the same for him? However, Paul suffers all things. He preaches the gospel without getting anything in return because he doesn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. He doesn't want people thinking that he's in it just to make a living. Or, and you see my, many, most of these really famous modern day pastors, they're not just making a living, they're living large off of the gospel. They're living it up. And verse 13 says, Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So even in the Old Testament, the priests who ministered about holy things partook of the offering. In Numbers 5, 9 through 10, you'll see this. And every offering of all the holy things of the children of Israel, which they bring unto the priest, shall be his. And every man's hallowed things shall be his. Whatsoever any man giveth the priest, it shall be his. So if someone ministers to you in spiritual things, it is good and right to minister to them in carnal things. Verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So if a man <clears throat> preaches the gospel, it's good and right for them to live of the gospel. And like I said, you don't want to take it too far. You can be like the TV evangelist crooks that don't just live of the gospel, they live large of a false gospel. If you're making enough money off the gospel to have a house bigger than an NFL player, then you're cutting some corners, most likely. Verse 15, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so, be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Paul is not saying all this for his own profit or because he wants something from the Corinthians. He would rather die than to have people think he was in it for the money. But you look at many preachers, it seems like that's exactly what they're in it for. Verse 16 says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And you know that the gospel that Paul preaches is the simple gospel that you find in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. How that Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that's the gospel that Paul preaches. Now verse 17, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, when Paul says a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, he's referring to how the Lord gave him the gospel. A dis dispensation is like dispensing something. It's God dispensing something. Verse 18, What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So Paul counts it as, a reward to know that he isn't getting paid by the Corinthians for preaching the gospel. He gets a reward for willingly preaching the gospel. And he's going to get a reward in heaven that will not fade away. See, this money down here, it's temporal. The stuff you're going to get in heaven is eternal. Now, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And in Philippians 2, 7, it talks about how the Lord took on the form of a servant. And Peter and Jude also call themselves servants. A true soldier of the cross will see himself as a servant, not as a big shot. Next, a tip to save some is to be flexible. Be willing to adapt and change as long as you don't compromise the King James Bible or the gospel or godly separation. And in verse 20, it says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. 
to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. So Paul became as a Jew, he even had a vow. He shaved his head, as it says in Acts 18, 18. You know, he was willing to do little things like that to show them that, you know, because they would think he was, he was a wicked if he didn't do certain things. And many times people will think you're wicked if you don't do certain things they're doing, whether it be wearing a tie or things like that. There's little things that you can do, even though that's not a, it's not a sin to, to not wear a tie or many other convictions people have. You can still do those things around the, the, those people. So that they just don't think you're you're being wicked or something. In verse 21, it says, To them that are without law is without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that were that without law. When Paul was around the Gentiles, he didn't worry about the Sabbath or circumcision. But if he would be around the Jews, he wouldn't teach those things as as a... As a means to getting salvation, but he would, you know, he would respect those things. Now, in verse 22, it says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So if Paul was around a weak brother who had convictions against something that wasn't a sin, he would still abstain from doing that particular thing. Paul was willing to step out of his comfort zone. He was willing to adapt and change if that will help win souls to the Lord. And Paul was willing not to eat certain meats if he knew it would wound the conscience of a weak brother. Paul was willing to not wear shorts during church basketball league if, he, if it would offend the brethren. He was willing to not invite a brother over for Christmas dinner if his brother thought a tree was a bell bush. You know, all these little things like that that you can do uh, today, you have to be willing to adapt. For example, a lot of preachers refuse to put their sermons on the Internet. Well, you can reach a lot of lost souls this way. A lot of them put them on the Internet, but will charge $8 a sermon or something like that. When it is completely free to put this stuff out there on the Internet, because it doesn't really cost much money or any money at all if you, like, put it on YouTube. So... You know, you want to adapt and change. Now, you don't want to take it to another extreme. You don't want to become as a rapper to win the rappers. You don't want to become as a headbanger to win the rockers. You don't want to start doing something sinful to win the lost. You can't save someone by partitioning in what has been keeping them down to start with. But a lot of people do that. A lot of Christians act like the sinful world to get a following from the sinful world. They aren't really doing it to win the loss, though. Even though they may think they are. Paul made himself all things for all men for the gospel's sake. Now, verse 23 and 24, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. If you're a Christian then you are running to win. Verse 25 says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. If you're a track star, then you're running to win a trophy that will fade away. If you're in the NBA, you're playing for a ring that will burn one day. All Bill Russell's rings will be non-existent. But you, if you're a Christian, then your crown will be an everlasting crown. And as a tip to help you save some, stay motivated in your race by remembering you're running for an incorruptible crown and not a corruptible crown, like all the athletes of the world are running for. Now, verse 26 and 27, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I sh myself should be a castaway. So as a tip to help you save some, you need to keep your flesh in check. You need to make sure you have your body in subjection. If you're living in sin and doing things that are sinful, then it isn't in subjection. If Paul started living for the world, then he would be a castaway and his ministry would be almost ineffective. So if you're going to save some, 
You need to act right in front of the lost world. Quit cussing. Quit telling dirty jokes. Quit laughing at the dirty jokes. Be an example. When you go to work, pull your Bible out and start reading it. Be an example to the lost world. This is going to help you save some. But this has been 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse by verse.